season of preparation, and I felt turned this time uh, to go to John the Baptist. You know, normally if you follow the lectionary, you get John the Baptist twice, always on the second and third um, Sundays. I don't always follow that, but here we are again. But we have to uh, hear John the Baptist say, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. In the Gospel of Luke, which we would have been highlighting this year, after the angel Gabriel visits Mary with the astonishing news that she will give birth to Jesus, Son of God, and she responds by saying, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Mary goes on to visit her cousin Elizabeth. It seems that even before they are born, these two, Jesus and John, have a connection. Mary goes on to sing her song, commonly called the Magnificat, which was what the call to worship was based upon, My Soul Magnifies the Lord. After Mary's song in Luke, John the Baptist is born, and Zachariah, at his son's circumcision and naming ceremony, still unable to speak for doubting the Gabriel confirms they are to call him John, although it was custom for the firstborn male to be named that had his father's name. It's at this moment that Zachariah's tongue is freed and filled with the Holy Spirit offers a divine word about the prophet his son will be. Chapter 2 is all about Jesus, his birth, which is the one that is most commonly read on Christmas Eve with the shepherds and the angels. It's the one in the Peanuts Christmas story, too. So we get another circumcision and naming ceremony, this time for Jesus. Another divine word by Simeon, if you've read the story of Luke. The chapter ends with a bit of a jump in time to Jesus, the boy wonder at the temple, stumbling the religious folk with a couple of frightened parents looking for their lost son. And that brings us to the reading for today. Luke 3, 1 through 14. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the word of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath of to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. And soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. This is the word of God. God is so speaking. Thanks be to God. Oh God, we wait. We wait for you, O oh Lord, to come into our lives, to brush up against us with your grace, your presence, your spirit. 
Spirit. Help us to prepare, O oh Lord, even though you know that we don't like waiting. It's so difficult for us, and yet we long for your peace, for justice in this world, for light to come into our darkness, bringing hope and promise and life. Bless the speaking, the hearing, and the living of your holy word. Amen. Advent encourages us to wait expectantly, to prepare for the arrival of the Christ child, to wait with a kind of active excitement, like something wonderful is about to happen at any moment. It's about trusting that God will make it happen. Perhaps even despite ourselves. And so the Lord sends us John the Baptist. It might not be what we want to hear, but I believe God knows what is best. Prepare the way of the Lord, he tells us. Make his path straight. At the center of that message, at the gut of anything that we say or do, there has to be Repentance, a willingness to change your life. If you're to have a cleansing, a, a spirit of reconciliation, a healing of the soul, a, a baptism upon you, then you must turn your heart to God with humility, and penitence, and surrender. The store, the door stands open, my friend. The door stands open and God is right there with arms wide open, pouring out the waters of forgiveness and grace and healing, waiting for your embrace, the surrender that will free your heart and the change that will give you life. But you've got to turn towards God. Thinking of repentance, it's often hard, it's difficult, Take that first step. Because repentance is never easy. We have a hard enough time simply admitting that we might be wrong in the first place. It's hard for us to admit that we don't have all the answers. That we might be seeing things only from our own limited perspective. It is a humbling thing to realize. But it is necessary if we are to make room for repentance. I think repentance also requires introspection. You have to take a look at your own life. You have to examine yourself. You have to realize that all of us stand in need of forgiveness. And you think, well, you know, maybe I could have been wrong. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I didn't really see it from their angle. At its heart, repentance means to turn. It means to turn from sinful ways and embrace God. And when you turn toward the Lord, you are to let God's glorious light just shine upon you and fill your world. To let the master potter take you in God's hands. And when you do that, you can't help but be humbled and humbled by God's glory. And in this glorious revelation, as our Lord pours the waters of forgiveness and grace and mercy upon you, you are renewed, restored, and given life. This is why Jesus was born, my friends, to bring you this forgiveness, this reconciliation, this salvation, this life. Because our God loves us so much, loves the whole world, loves each of us with such passion and unconditional love. And the Lord is asking us, begging us, enticing us to turn towards Him so that we may be healed, that our souls may be healed. God speaks directly to us, speaking words of comfort and Grace, speaking words that will bring us wholeness and new life. Speaking right into our very hearts. 
In the passage, John goes on to talk about fruits that are worthy of repentance. He's jumping ahead now. He wants to see that that repentance has taken hold, that God has taken hold in your heart. He's looking for signs of a changed heart. And he couples that with some pretty harsh language. He calls the people a brood of vipers. Like being called a brood of vipers. He talks of axes and fire and judgment. Is he just mad? Is he mad at us? Or perhaps does he echo the fierce love of God? The fierce love of God who wants us to make a change in our lives. Who desperately wants us to turn and embrace the God. He loves us. And what shall we do, the crowd asked. Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Don't treat people unfairly or take advantage of them because of your power. Don't take bribes or store money. Let your actions show the love of God so that your life bears the signs of a changed heart. Now we read those words, and sometimes I think our, our inclination is to think of it only in individualistic terms. That God is speaking directly to me, John the Baptist is saying these words just to me. If I have two coats, I'm supposed to share. But I believe that John was also talking to us as a community. And John the Baptist was talking about the kind of society that we live in and the kind of society that God wants us to have. In effect, when you consider the scope of God's love, we realize that John the Baptist is really talking about equity and justice. Equity and justice. John is imagining a world, and it's clear in the Gospels this is where Jesus is headed. A world where there is no hunger. A world where there is no pain or disease. There's no malice or <coughs> want. And all three of those things that John the Baptist highlights, they all can be thought of in terms of a fair and just economic system. He's talking about things of the economy. He's talking about so that there won't be a need, so that there won't be poor, and so there won't be those that go away hungry. Now, Christmas is a very special time of the year. You know, it, it's amazing to me because sometimes at Christmas time, even the harshest part and turn soft. I don't know, there's something magical in the air. I don't know, maybe they're just making a tax-deductible gift to a worthy charity. I don't care, but what matters is it does seem that hearts are a bit softer this time. Charity is a wonderful blessing, and it is a gift of grace. But let us also be honest, when we think about charity, Sometimes charity can exasperate the problem. What I mean is it's sort of like enabling an alcoholic. And it's easy for us to talk about charity. It's easy for us to talk about giving and love and sharing. And that's a wonderful thing and an act of grace. But let us also not forget that God cares about justice. That this is what our Lord most desires. It's justice that is advocated by John the Baptist. And it is justice for the oppressed. The ancient meaning of redemption and salvation that Jesus Christ ushers in. Is John not telling us that if we are to bear the signs of a changed heart, then we must work for a better world. For a world that is just. Even a just economy. When I was working on this sermon, I 
went back, and as I always do, I, sometimes I go through old illustrations. I have a big cache of these things over the 20 years of my ministry. And so I look at different things to figure out you know, what goes with the sermon. That's the, and I came across one that is a little bit old, and it's uh, this long sort of poem, if you will, article by a young man. And it was written in 2006, and to give you some perspective, that is before the iPhone. So the iPhone came out in 2007. So it's 12 years old. It's younger than my son here, Ben, but, you know, uh, still. And what is amazing to me, uh, I found this in a Heifer International. They often, we would buy, you know, animals from them, uh, you know, when we sponsor. It's a nice gift to give. Well, they, they have this program that would encourage uh, combining performing arts and activism. And a young man named Daniel Abzacha, I don't know if I said his name right, was in 11th grade when he wrote this article. And it's called 27. 27. Listen. Did you hear that? 27 children just died of hunger in the last minute. A son sets over the poisoned heart of a child in Chernobyl. An orphan in Mozambique lies awake, staring into the eyes of the AIDS epidemic that took his family. A homeless child hiding against the wreckage of Honduras prays that her makeshift shelter will keep the storm at bay. A Navajo Indian child cannot sleep for the murmur of hunger of his hungry stomach whispers nightmares in his waking nights. Four children thousands of miles apart all breathe their last breath together. You didn't hear them, do you? Did you? The howl, the natural disasters, the cry of the hungry, the silence of the chained. Do you hear them? No. It seems that as mankind advances towards a brighter age, the world as we know it has grown dim. Connections between people are no longer necessary for survival. We have, it seems, retreated into ourselves. Our responses are triggered by the drone of the alarm clock, the ringing of the phone, the charismatic voice of a television commercial. We have walked through life with eyes closed. Zombies strain through TV screens and cubicles and advertisements. Soft, unworked hands have met three square meals a day, and I know it seems hard to hear these children over the sound of our chewing. But while we are fed power and contentment, hunger, pain, and fear are the daily bread of the poor. Twenty-seven children of men are killed by the fear led that, that fed to their malnourished bodies. But their lives were once punctuated with something stronger than fear, something that kept these children going through both the good times and the bad. Hope. Hope is all they ever had. Our society may have more stuff than the impoverished ones, but that sense of hope in the face of emptiness is something missing in ours. Where does the common bond of hope that draws the communities of the poor together. That sense of helplessness that makes families so strong. And that kind of connection between people cannot be made through glowing television screens or endless rows of cubicles. We need to wake up. We need to hear the children sing the songs of hope as well as the ones of pain. Celebrations of life as well as acknowledgments of death. The whispers as well as the outcries, it's all there. We may be in the dark, but their cries of hope can still reach us. Find it within yourself to feel. Look, touch, hear, taste, smell. Find the strength when you're within yourself to be sympathetic. Be angry. Be hopeful. Be something, but feel. And once our perception is clear, once we silence the drone of machinery in our heads, then we can connect 
Imagine a free trade on happiness, a relief wave of social justice, full stomachs as well as full hearts. These are all possible. Listen. Can you hear them sing? That's the end of the article. Now I did a little research and actually things have gotten a little bit better. That 27, that was because 27 minutes, if you did the math, 27 children in a minute died from hunger. So I did some research, we've gotten a little better. Now, currently 16,000 children die every day of hunger. That's today. And so if you brought that down and did all the math, it would be 12 children a minute. So 27 down to 12. But still, 12 is, I think, too many. And actually, the number is starting to go up again. With climate change creating more natural disasters and droughts, the political conflict of our world and all that is uncertain, that number is rising once again. And what shall we do? The crowds ask him. Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. To offer fruits worthy of repentance, then our lives must bear the signs of a changed heart, a caring heart, a life that works for a better world where no child dies of hunger, where no children that are immigrants die in U.S. custody. My friends, in this time of Advent, let us prepare ourselves for God to come into our lives once again. Let the Spirit of God wash over us with the water of forgiveness. We are being redeemed. We have been redeemed, and God's Spirit is coming once again to make all things new. The baptism of God's love is a wonderful, gracious gift to all of us. And we know that we can all know the presence of Christ because God is always there to surround us with comforting grace, that grace that is needed to restore our souls. But don't let it just sit there, my friends. Let it take you someplace. Bear the signs of a changed heart and live lives that are worthy of that repentance. As we share and help others, as we work for justice, as we show this world the love of our Savior. Thanks be to God. Amen.